Can it, I just want to check, can people see that in the chat? Cool. No, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, cool. Um, Jennifer, are we recording? Yes. Yeah, so just let me know that cool. I'm recording. Okay, then. If you don't wish to be, please switch your screen off. Um, and, uh, cool. Yeah, so... Sorry. Yeah, cool. So um, for those of you that are new, um, we're the Social Art Network Sheffield. So we're a Sheffield-based community of artists committed to building agency for the field of art and social practice. Um, we host regular meetups and activities for artists and those involved with and interested in social practice, as well as support and advocacy for, for artists, projects and practices. And we work collaboratively with other regional hubs across the UK as Social Art Network UK. Um, so for tonight's meetup, we're joined by the Food Hall Project and a number of branch projects which have emerged from the Food Hall community. Um, and for those of you which aren't aware of what Food Hall is, Food Hall is a multi-award winning community and cultural centre in Sheffield with an open public kitchen, social eating space, social art programming, workshops, pottery facilities and more. Food Hall accommodates a number of initiatives and branch projects and experiments with new models towards some of society's biggest issues, as well as vital and exciting social and cultural initiatives. Um, so today we have a number of Food Hall community members who will share and discuss social art practices which have emerged from the project and its branch projects which are at the intersection of art, culture and the social. Um, so to begin with, we're going to start with a short breakout session. Um, just to sort of for a chance to say hi to each other and just sort of get comfortable in the call. So if you could just say hi, just introduce yourself. And I don't know, as a bit of an icebreaker, could just sort of say like, you know, what food you're looking to share with people in the near future. Um, so I think Jennifer, are you ready to put people into breakout rooms? Excellent, cool. So that'll just be five minutes as well. Hello. <laughs> We've ended up in the same breakout room. I did try to jiggle it around a little bit. Hi, I'm Jennifer Booth. Yeah, I think this is. I think this is the. Um, I mean, it's fine, but this is the um, is main room. Yeah, that's it's not a breakout room. All oh, right. Okay. Um, I think I don't know whether you can jump into. Oh yeah, you can. You can click join to join a breakout room. Okay. Um, if you want to, I think room five right. is particularly empty, but. Quite nice just to sort of float and <laughs> yeah i just have a look through i'm just gonna send a just a uh, broadcast so we're giving them five minutes aren't we that's great yeah i tried to move people around a little bit are we going to ask them what they wanted to cook or we're just going to leave it i did ask before um to say as a prompt, um, what yeah. what meal are you looking forward to sharing in the near future? Oh, nice little turnout. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, 
good number. Jennifer, are you able to just? Great. Uh, We're thanks. recording. Perfect. Oh, all good to go. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, hi, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. Um, I'm going to just get the technical stuff right. Can everyone share, see that screen that I've just shared? Brilliant. Um, I'm not going to go full screens because it, it means that I can't see my notes, which is an unfortunate um, technical drama. But um, I... So hi everyone, I'm Louis from the Futal Project, uh, one of the founders of the Futal Project. Um, in this presentation, I'm really excited because James is a really, really good friend of mine and we've spoken a lot about this presentation and also it's lovely to have so many people from all of the different branches coming on stage, on a single stage, which is a magical a feat that James has coordinated because everyone's so <laughs> distributed and <laughs> doing little bits and in a nimble way. Um, so I'm super stoked that like everyone's here to share the... Um, yeah, share the platform, which is going to be really cool to hear everyone. Um, so my talk is going to kick us off uh, talking about the core structure, kind of a relationship between the social sciences and the social art um, and the social architecture, as James just mentioned, and my thoughts about that, my ponderings, musings, whatever you want to call them, uh, but how, how research has helped us develop our, um, our project. Uh, looking at kind of how that's led into this idea of flexible social architecture um, and how we've developed this kind of unique approach with our branches um, and then talk a bit about some of the output from some of the branches and some of the early days as well, which would be nice um, kind of recap on what's almost seven, I think it's close to eight years which is mind boggling, but still fresh, still here, live and kicking, you know, the Food Hall Project moves endlessly on. Um, so uh, I'm gonna kick off with a quick video um, and let me know if there are any problems with the, uh, the sound for this. Can you hear it? Food is the way that cultures interact with each other beyond language. When someone comes into food or they experience a patchwork quilt of almost a hundred different cultures. The aim of the project is to bring everyone together. So it's creating a public space where anyone, regardless of who they are or what they have, can come and share together. This breaks down the barrier between taking the service and using the service. So they encourage people to join in, like do some national, to get to chat to everybody, just create a community really. I think the most rewarding part of volunteering at Food Hall is just the genuine human connection that you get to feel. I feel most like myself or like at least closest to who I want to be when I'm here. It's one of the few things that allows people to come together but also share culture and meaning with each other. You're sharing something beyond food just by sharing food. Um, so the core of the Food Hall project um, is to kind of create uh, an infrastructure for sharing, specifically around food sharing, but also culture sharing and artistic activity sharing. Um, so the work of the core activity is essentially the creation and maintenance of platforms and infrastructure for food and culture sharing so that people can participate in the life of the city. And this is uh, not, this is a more foundational level than just providing the food ourselves or we consider it to be a more foundational level it's providing the infrastructure for collective thrivability so the spaces places social systems economic uh, systems that we need in order to um, allow different people from different backgrounds to engage with each other and share um, so this is this idea of a food sharing infrastructure which is actually something very different from the idea of kind of a high street shop uh it's not about food retail but it's a kind of new understanding or a new model of organization as an experiment um the distinction is not selling products but providing spaces and systems for people to share products and services with each other either freely or with different systems in a way similar to websites or services like that um so we're uh, which is very a very different way of providing and producing space in the city and providing services within the city. Um, and it's not normally how things are made. Um, 
the branches, um, if you see on this diagram, are kind of separate voluntary organizations that essentially are allowed to build on top of this kind of core um, social eating space or core activity. Uh, we, and in many cases, they're also independent, so they become their own organization or voluntary group um, that um, has its own uh, dynamic and really incredible impact in the city. Um, one of our, this is one of our oldest images. One of my wonderful, I love these, love uh, showing my little sketches that were like kind of <laughs> ideas, um, but then they became uh, like reality and they kind of underpinned everything we did for the next like five years or, oh, you know, which kind of mental when you think about it like that. But I love uh, recapping and kind of like feeling the gravity of like what that actually means uh, today, you know, after several years of undertaking that process. So, um, so this was produced in 2016. Uh, some of our core work uh, from 2016 to 2019 was creating this kind of feedback loop of uh, research and actions. So um, the research in, a, in essence was this kind of idea of social sciences and like looking at architecture uh, or seeing architecture as a social science um, and the actions or the implementations were the responses to those needs or the creativity and the utility or intelligence we need to deliver things for the city that people need. So for example, um, we, for example, the kind of the research we created um, allowed us to create proposals. Uh, the research we created took insights from the environment and that allowed us to take, make proposals based on that research that then allowed us to kind of create or new interventions in the city that might not otherwise be created or might not otherwise um, have existed. Um, and that continued process uh, of kind of agile recursive, um, like reinterpretation uh, allowed a really kind of um, multifunctional, multi-use and quite um, multifaceted series of spaces and interventions. Um, this was a view from the sky, a wonderful sketch also from 2016 of it then, and it's changed a lot since then. Uh, but there's a cafe space in the front and there's kind of a creative space in, in the back. Um, the idea uh, underpinning a lot of this because of this process or this idea was this concept of flexibility, um, which uh, the space developed, you know, the idea of flexibility in space developed from this action research structure, the idea that we needed something if we we're going to continue to do this, um, create infrastructures that are underpinned by sharing food. Um, we needed some kind of like uh, flexible spaces that allowed us to respond. Um, so for a long time, uh, this this took a lot of inspiration from things like situationist ideas um, that the city should always be perpetually transformed but also inspiration from things like Cedric Price's generator um, that took signals from the environment and responded to them. So for a long time in the food hall, my role was essentially a signal receiver Sounds like I'm a drummer bass MC or something. I'm a signal receiver, but um, I actually, you know, I spent a lot of time in the space and kind of like interpreted what people needed from lots of different backgrounds and tried my best to kind of help them uh, develop these programs and things from this feedback. Um, and we developed this idea of what we called a non-service, uh, building from ideas of non-space. Um, so this kind of evolved into, um, a kind of pipeline of essentially ways of reinterpreting and re-engaging with spaces. So the social eating spaces um, were set at the front, they were quite static, uh, and they gave us a stream of kind of new input from the local environment. Um, my spouse, my, as I said, myself and several other people have spent several years uh, within this context, uh, helping people, talking to people, listening to people. Um, we then could create plans, read, change and reorientate the flexible spaces and respond to those more hard to define needs in the rear of the space. So perpetual growth of and change of these spaces was supported by a kind of means of production. So our workshops and our facilities. Um, and we saw this kind of evolve over the years into tons of different iterations and, and a, a really healthy amount of change, um, which kind of reflects itself in the kind of the uh, changes of the 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 services or the, the things we we provide shifted with with the times and the needs. So um, we we have I would say we've 
evolved into almost seven different entirely different cultural institutions over the years providing different services that community needed um, and responding to artistic and cultural movements so here's a really um early facade um and this was kind of like you know uh, created with scraps of the original wiki house, <laughs> which is really interesting when that was a big thing or uh, coming out of Sheffield. Um, we Here's a, an example of a movable block, block facade, which allowed a lot of different people to kind of move these blocks. And that was a, for a large time how we um, engage with people on the stoop. This is our most recent facade. Um, and this was created to mark the inception of the National Food Service. So in uh, and here's a blurry picture of one of our uh, funniest ones, which was the bubble facade. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of the ideas was that we would create this kind of, um, or we had this long running joke of creating the most active street frontage. And that um, stems or evolves from the idea of, um, we were refused funding when we first started and decided that we were gonna create the most active <laughs> street frontage there was. <laughs> as a response to that so here's a here's an example of, of that wonderful activity with anger yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was my 20 i think it was my 2016 self there um having fun um so we um this uh, self-refinement process um, was really responsive and actually it, as our core activity continued in this way, our insights grew and we, need, we knew we needed a way to manage the diversity of need as it kept on growing and changing. Uh, so we created what we called branches that could respond to these uh, ongoing trends um, continually. Um, and in 2017, we also opened up the opportunity uh, for members to create new branches of the project um that were independent voluntary organizations in 2019 um there were um a, an enormous number of events and activities in the space um this included free uh you know almost free flexible events per week um we accommodated around 55 events um and yeah like essentially we did a, a large number of public talks and platformed uh, an enormous amount of artists with the Lates branch, who James Rogers was um, a core contact for. Um, the most of our activity, um, one moment, I'm just gonna move into the other room, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so most of our activity maintained a shared agenda for open and equal access. Um, so this meant the sharing economy of food, donation, entry, um, kind of contributing how you can economy, um, the prioritization of social interaction um, over and above alcohol consumption, um, but also to focus on real, um, real need and providing for the real needs of local communities rather than the assumed needs or the needs of kind of one individual or, or even class group. Um, so these structures allowed a broad demographic for people to attend and benefit. Um, so the idea was that it, it became a space that essentially opposed gent or was the opposite of gentrification, meaning that the quality increase um, of the area was um, was experienced by all um, and it didn't marginalize anybody and it didn't create inaccessible spaces and places but also it created a system which was the opposite of addiction. So you could go to events and activities that um, weren't prioritizing alcohol consumption or drugs or anything like that. In fact, they were prioritizing cultural sharing. And uh, that means that also it, it um, stopped social marginalization and allowed people to participate better in their communities. Um, so a lot of our end users and people who um, come to user space for uh, some of our free food provision um, got into the cultural activities and built entire communities uh, based on the kind of artistic and cultural creation we, we developed. Built. Um, so here are a few shots of the atmosphere. Um, I'm just gonna run through just to give you a, uh, a broad idea. Um, Here's the kind of cafe, uh, the frontage. Um, this, in contrast, is the 
a kind of an image of some of our events, um, which uh, from 2016 to 2019 would look normally kind of experimental um, sound and music events. Um, a gallery exhibition example, um, talks, lectures, interviews, big sharing meals with art events, um, discussion circles, um, kind of like philosophical chats, um, cooking, social cooking, which is different from, different from cooking alone because you're cooking with a large team and a group as a social activity, uh, rather than to just create food um, for yourself to consume or consume. Um, our messy backspace, um, which is uh, now a legendary, like the mess space, like there's just endless amounts of mess. And at this point there was just this kind of like, um, yeah, trolley that just was living there. And no one knew where to put the trolley <laughs> because we were picking up food from the local supermarkets and things like that, filmed. Um, and also it created an, a number of for visual artists, um, or those interested in visual arts, these, uh, this branch project uh, system, but also the the diversity of things that we created, grew a kind of an eclectic aesthetic. So, for example, here's one of our uh, our like uh, early promotional club flyers for our um, our lunch club, uh, and here's a, a, a promotion for the Wednesday night meals cooked for the community by the community. They were called our plates. Um, so every Wednesday we had a big public meal after hours that a particular group was platformed and you know like we had all sorts of groups um you could everyone you could imagine <laughs> got together and created things uh late who myself and james rogers worked on for a really long time um which was kind of arts and music um grew its own idea and we also saw it also meant that we could create artistic events and cultural events that were really specific to this mixture or melting pot of demographics and groups for example and i'm going to give you highlight one example but we've done a few different exhibitions of this kind um where people come into the space and they might um be on the edges of society um and they need kind of informal support or services but they're actually artists or they're practicing as artists and they kind of like um have always wanted to exhibit or create things in the space and we actually find that a lot of the challenges people face are you know are about creating new identities and ideas of forming new identity systems uh, so one example is Zumina who was a, a refugee who was trafficked and just wanted to store some artwork so on discovering and listening to the insights of their life um, that all their work had been destroyed up to that point because they were in modern day slavery we decided that it was most important to produce a show so we created this professional exhibition dedicated to them and their story and this is the kind of exhibition that I don't know or I haven't seen uh, a thing you know like or it might be difficult to produce in, in other situations um, because of the pipeline of events and discussion. So I'm going to play you this quick video of Zoom and his uh, exhibition from his own voice. Artists for me is not what I see. It's not what I think. It's what I feel. My art of working is the shape of my feelings, the shape of my perception, the shape of my intuition, is the colors of my emotion. I am a Shomina. I'm a victim of human trafficking. With 17 years old, I was trafficked to Europe to work in a sexual slavery, where I spent more than 10 years of my life. At such a young age, this traumatic experience made me completely lost in my essence, my pudo, my principles, and in my expectations from life. After with many mistakes, I learned quickly how to survive in a hunter world. I always saw myself in different personalities, in different identities, and I had to use that to work this street. After every client left from my room, I had to face myself. I had completely frustrated feelings and disturbed emotion. All that I could do was take the next path to find the energy again and make my makeup and back to the street. I had two ways to escape from my reality. One was taking drugs, another was artists. That's how arts come to me. As an artist, I realized that this was for me a big 
and the real performance experience. This is where my self, my mind exhibition comes from. Now, between glass, clay, plaster, fabric, paint and brush, I express my deep feelings and the shape of my imagination. Any material that inspired me could be used for any specific details. My inspiration comes from inside me, guided from my intuition. My artwork is the interface of my heart. It's my connection with energy, frequency, and vibration. It's a piece from my own performance in my life. So, zoom in a, um Zoom in and made some really powerful artwork and the idea of um, uh, a process to, for them to reclaim their reality was the kind of um, artwork uh, that seems really important um, in our society. So it's, it's, it was an honor to platform and help and work and collaborate with Zoom in on their first exhibition, um, which was uh it was really powerful and moving um as well as this this kind of work we um our branch projects and our activities extended our artistic uh, and curatorial um, expertise into other areas um for example our 20 uh it was, I think it was 2018, um, conversion of uh, the Abidel Picture House, where we supported them in uh, changing the Abidel Picture House into a large art gallery and art space um, for a period of time, um, which was a really powerful series of exhibitions. Um, the yeah, our late group um, kind of collectively helped create. Um, and you know, a series we've done any number of kind of pop-ups and um, experiences outside of uh, the food hall space, as well as this um, kind of activity. We grew one of our most uh, prominent branches is something that's kind of grown, outgrown us, or become bigger than us, uh, which is really beautiful to see. So the National Food Service grew life as a branch. Um, and uh, it was something that started in, in uh, yeah, like, looking back 2017 was a really inspirational year, this happened in 2017 as well. But um, and now it's formed into a the idea of a new public service where it's kind of a unity structure between different social eating spaces and a way of creating them. So uh, a system which allows the perpetual uh, social reproduction of social uh, space. Um, so the idea now is um, kind of is food hall the future of our high streets. Um, so I guess I wanted to bring this in because uh, John, I think, uh, is John in the audience? And uh, James also, um, have we got time to play this video? What do you think? Yeah. Um, so they're exploring a lot of stuff in the Venice Biennale this year uh, around Studio Polpo. They're exploring a lot of stuff in the Venice Biennale in this year around uh, the future of high streets. And um, it's really cool that they've, um, we're working with them or have been working with them to um, be shown uh, here. So I'm really proud of that. And also like, it just shows the incredible community that we've got in Sheffield um, and the kind of incredible cultural changes we're making, but also Studio Popo are really early and important collaborators with us. have done so much amazing work in the city. So um, it's really cool to, to talk about this with them. The high street is often thought of as a space simply for shopping and for buying things. And I think one of the threats to the high street is that this framing limits more diverse social and economic transactions, which could be key to reviving the high street. The narrative has been very much that high streets are a space of kind of consumption but we think this is problematic because it's led to two responses one of which is trying to attract big business to the high street which often means that the money doesn't go back into those local communities and secondly trying to gentrify them and attract wealthier middle class people to those sites <laughs> We want to find a different kind of starting place for thinking about the high street. Some of the projects and people we've been working with are doing things like working with supermarkets to reuse food waste and create spaces that are open through kind of pay as you feel to a much broader kind of segment of society. We've been looking at the ways in which 
changing rooms are used as a kind of social space, as spaces of care. And um, we've been thinking about spaces like the library, which is potentially a site of public learning and education. Listening on the high street, acting on the high street, sharing on the high street, uh, we see um, a more hopeful, productive space that can emerge. <laughs> Firstly, think about the high street, not just as a space of buying and shopping. And secondly, uh, look at the opportunities that exist for collective and community-based actions and transactions. What are the things that you kind of really value? Is it the chance to have a chat with your hairdresser? Is it being able to go to the library and support one another in kind of learning something new? And then to try and work with others to kind of amplify those things. So to conclude, oh, sorry, um, I'm just going to do a quick wrap up now. Uh, I realise I'm probably a few minutes over now. Um, but to conclude, our organisation grew um, kind of its core activity from this idea of a recursive loop of social science understanding and kind of social art um, implementation or even organisational implementation. So like um, thinking about ways that we might approach the problems we understood better. But this um, led us to create a series of uh, flexible architecture spaces, which learned from the likes of Fre Frederick Price, evolving social eating, social art, social maker spaces, etc. But the unique approach also gave us a sensory understanding of what the local area wants, but also provided a gateway for us to respond creatively. These responses became um, a system of branches, which will create, so the first of which were created in-house, but then uh, afterwards, other collectives and groups started to join us and use um, helped voluntary and enterprising organizations grow themselves from the bedrock of resources we have. Many of these branches did incredible things for them, uh, things themselves, such as Social Pickle or Open Journal, who are going to talk soon, but also should be considered to have merit in their own right as independent from the project. Um, some even went on to become organizations much bigger than the food hall, such as the National so Food Service, a branch that was created um, in 2017, as now a national network of uh, organizations towards the same goal um, so I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna conclude it there and thanks for taking the time to listen to my talk guys uh, really really appreciate it um, I'll stop share <laughs> conclude it there stop share yeah thanks uh, so much Lou that was great as always really great um, I think what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna I mean as you were saying it'd be really great just to sort of um, just introduce you to a couple of people who lead some of the branch projects at Food Hall as well. Um, so we'll hear a little more from Hannah and Ross who are from Social Pickle later and we'll hear later as well from James Rogers from Social Sculpture. Um, but I'd, I'd first like to bring in Moss who leads um, the Open Journal. So if Moss you'd like to say a few words about that. Hey, uh, yeah thanks James. Uh, yeah so I'm going to talk about um, Open Journal which is one of Food Hall's current branch projects. Uh, it's an open grassroots publication and it's Food Hall's tangible common space for collective expression, that's how we describe it. Um, it's been coordinated by various people over the years and I reignited it um, earlier this year. Um, and when it's running, it's um, a quarterly publication. Uh, so I've got issue one here. Um, this is issue one of 2021 and it's um, currently available for purchase like on a pay-as-you-can kind of basis. Uh, James is going to put the link to the online shop um, to buy this uh, and it's full of um, like submissions from the food hall community so it's full of art, poetry, photography, uh, recipes, articles um, and all the proceeds obviously go to food hall. Um, so it's created from, yeah like I said, it's from submissions from the food hall community so I just want to put out a call um, to anyone who's sort of making anything at the moment that we'd love to include anything that you would like to submit to the, um, the journal, sort of create a snapshot of the community. Um, so we accept anything that can be printed on paper other than exceptional circumstances. And uh, James will also put the email in the chat to send anything in you want to um, be submitted. Uh, so yeah, that's all I've got to talk about Open Journal. And uh, so I'll pass back to James, thank you. Yeah, great, thanks a lot, Moss. Um, I'll also, introduce you as well to Emmett. Um, Emmett leads um, Art Hall, um, which is a sort of collective of various different arts activities that happen at Food Hall. I don't know if you'd like to say a bit more about that, Emmett. Hi. Um, well, Art, art Hall's really a kind of a really big 
section of food hall, I, I wouldn't say that I, I, I lead it really. It's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it, but, but I've been involved in, in, uh, in it quite, um, I've been quite heavily involved in it this year. Mm. But um, so the, the art section of Boot Hall, um, it, um, I think Louis already talked quite a lot about the kind of exhibitions we've been running and that kind of thing. But, but I would also say, I mean, Boot Hall been heavily involved in quite a lot of arts events, including things like cinema, uh, that kind of thing for a long time. But um, I was just saying, we're having a meeting next week because uh, we're coming towards the possibly the end of lockdown. And we're, uh, I want to start looking now at the kind of things that we need to do to start getting art running again. Um, and we will be holding more meetings through Food Hall um, over the next few months, hopefully. Um, so if anybody wants to come along to that, um, we'll have, I mean, we'll have links up on Slack soon, but maybe I can get in touch with you on Instagram. If yeah, you want to I mean, what we can do, that, Emmett, we I can, can... Post, I can post the links. Maybe I'll post the links on uh, uh, Facebook as well. Yeah, so, that would be great. We can also include some details after the meeting. We'll, so we'll send out, um, we'll send out an email um, just thank, um, in follow up and we can include any details there. Emmett, that you want to pass on as well. Um, okay, well, that, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, cool. So I think what we'll do now, we'll just open it up, really, if, if anyone want, has any comments or questions that they want to ask um, towards Louis or any of the, um, of the branch project people we just in, introduced. Um, yeah, so over to you, really. If you, You're welcome to sort of just speak out or you can drop a message in the chat, whichever you feel most comfortable. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, is there any way, I noticed in one of the pictures of, the, of Louis' presentation, there was a person with a wheel, uh, electric wheelchair. That's fantastic. How would you engage people with learning disabilities and profound learning disabilities and other marginalised groups in the community so they have a real presence and not um, in community spaces? Um, because often they end up going just to places where there are other people with learning disabilities, mm. if you know what I mean. Mm. Mm. That's a really, really good question. Um, should I answer that? Um, I, um, so one of the ways we do help people with learning disabilities is that we have wellbeing coordinators on site day to day. So wellbeing coordinators are essentially these kind of um, general well-being um, humans that <laughs> help people with their needs and desires uh, in the local area and that normally uh, it's kind of a mixture between the services they provide or a mixture between coaching kind of like if people's morale is down um, giving them a bit of a pep talk and reminding them to think see the light you know and remember things are, are good um, but other things are like taking a bit of feedback from what they want and, uh, and other things include kind of like um, having uh, important discussions with people. So those are professionals who um, run that. Um, Dave and Johnny, they're really brilliant at well-being um, activity. And they um, they came, you know, essentially they, uh, yeah, they've been working with us for the past year during the pandemic. And, um, but we've always had this structure where we try to have points of contact at the front even if we haven't had the money to employ people at a time to um, help with well-being activity at least there's a point of contact who will listen to people um, listen to their particular needs and try their best because obviously we can't solve everything but we can try our best to accommodate whatever the particular need is um, and being well aware that those are different for different people and they you know also try and our best not to label anyone do you know one of the big things in food hall is trying not to label people as mm. though, so, you know, people really need, you know, their own identity, which is one of the most important things is like, um, and it, it helps people overcome problems actually often. Um, so yeah, uh, that's one Maybe of the ways we do it. It's mental health, mental health awareness week, isn't it at the mm. moment? Mm. And I, I'll have to put it in the, I found something 
which I'll have to put in the chat because I can't think of the name of it. But it was some people who um, kind of were anti mental health awareness week for various reasons. They were people with um, kind of a similar thing that you do. And I just think I ought to put a link to it because it sounds really interesting. And they, uh, one of the people who have written a real a blog that I think everybody should read. And it chimes with a lot of the ethos of Food Hall, um, just having a place where people can drop in and chat and not having labels and um, spaces for people to be. And especially if you are always at the mercy of services and appointments and what do you do with the rest of your time? Uh, and, there's, and the way that statutory services have gone it, and cuts, it means there's a lot of people out there who don't have anywhere meaningful to go and to engage. And I just wonder if what you do does also fulfill that niche mm. that it's welcoming. Mm. Yeah, th and this is something really powerful, actually. This is the idea of the National Food Service is like if we can create a National Food Service, we can also create almost a, a framework for social prescription as within yeah. that or kind of a system yeah. which allows um, that a lot of uh, problems aren't a doctor can't solve them, do you know, and then neither should they try like, in mm. many cases, it's the thrivability it's the social spaces we live and the people we see that will solve our problems and if yeah. people can't actually access those people like how how is society ever gonna um gonna get better so yeah no i, I really resonate with that and it sounds um it sounds like a really good uh article like please send over uh, i'll have a look i'll have a look i'm right. really looking at it down it's because i'm looking Right, we've got time for perhaps two more questions or if there's anything yeah. desperately you wanted to put in the yeah, chat. Jennifer, I was just going to jump in. Um, I'm just going to jump in there because I've just noticed we've got Ian in the call, who I hadn't spotted earlier, who also um, did a really interesting um, sort of branch, uh, effectively a branch project at, um, at Food Hall as well, in, club, in collaboration with Food Hall. So I don't, I don't know if you just wanted to say, just say a couple of lines about that, Ian. Yes, sorry, you caught me off guard. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't spot you there. No, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, really briefly, um, I'm involved in a project called Open Kitchen Social Club, um, which has some similar aims to Food Hall uh, in that it's a, a point of service social eating project um, where food is provided for free or um, if people want to donate, they're welcome to. Um, we support primarily um, asylum seekers, refugees and migrants, but we, we, we see um, our community is made up of um, people from all backgrounds. Um, and we were operating, before the pandemic, we were op operating three um nomadic cafe events in different places around Sheffield every week and one of those was at food hall and was called universal cafe um, and was um specifically for people who had were being um put onto the universal credit at the time which was like summer 2019 and um, so that ran from summer in 2019 through to um whenever the the everything shut down i guess it was march mm. 2020 yeah. and it was kind of coming to the end the two things that 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 it's, a, it's still sort of an open book really um because one thing that happened with the project was that um the universal credit wasn't in the end rolled out in the, in the way that it was threatened to be because um, the government just just made such a like appalling mess of it um, that that it all had to be rolled back. So 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 it wasn't actually rolled out, and it wasn't it wasn't quite as sort of disastrous as it was we thought it was going to be. Uh, so we didn't see the numbers that we we thought we were going to. Um, and mm. because the pandemic hit, I think. Like actually, you know, it's a good. It's a good point because um, maybe um, some of the we 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 could do is kind of getting together with with food hall and just um, just sort of 
taking some learning from it because I think you know when when the pandemic hit a year ago we were like like food hall open kitchen was just mm. like straight into um a kind of crisis mode which which we are um still operating in um so i think you know there's there's, there's conversations to be had there but um yeah i think what what we're interested in with that project was um bringing different groups of people uh, into food hall and and seeing it as a um a space of collective learning and how um mm. how we might how we might like develop practices around these kind of um draconian top-down measures that that and, and, and that, that are obviously affecting people at the bottom the worst um and so providing space where people can um you know first be fed and secondly get advice and thirdly learn collectively about the the, the the things that that you know the, these processes that that we have to learn about like like navigating the benefit system um and finally which which i you know is, is still kind of um there's a lot of material that, I, that i've gathered for this this final bit which is which is um you know how to how to how to put people's experiences out there how to forefront the people's you know the kind of experiences that people have been through um, in their own words and in in mm. collaboration with those people and how to how to put that experience into into um, into the public sphere um, so that people um, who don't know what it's like to be in that situation can can start to um, you know think about that a bit more. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's. I think there's a lot of scope for that kind of work to be done at Food Hall, as well. Mm. Um, and obviously, there, are, there, are, there, are, there is that work is being done at Food Hall. But yeah, mm. um, it's something that Louis and I have talked about quite a bit. Great, thanks so much, Ian. Um, I think we're gonna just, just because it. Oh, one question time, left. Go, sorry, sorry, we Yeah, I was just gonna go to like, Beth. Yeah. I was just gonna go to Beth's question in the chat. Um, so what measures do you have in place to resist gentrification? And I think that's to you, Louis. Very, very good question. Um, very hard answer. Uh, gentrification happens in all forms, uh, mental, physical and social, you know. So um, the idea of gentrification being just something that kind of is about land or is, is false you know like actually it can be organizational people can gentrify the, which is really important um one of the re one of the core ideas of the food hall um which has always underpinned a lot of our work is that the service user um you know is a service provider or you know like in the sense of like we have this reciprocal dynamic of mutual aid at the very at the kind of we break down that barrier between these these two groups and, and we try to uh change or challenge the notion of um of only the people providing the service are people who um you know are time rich essentially you know um or a kind of you know because i think that one of the big issues we've faced in the past is that we need to ensure and it's an ongoing it's an ongoing thing we're facing um but the reality is is that we need to ensure that there's not necessarily the meetings or the platforms that are like in a kind of a format that say middle class people would enjoy attending like a, a meeting where they can all talk rather we create systems which tease out information from people who might not be so forthcoming in those um in those kinds of group meetings um and we we create systems where we actually listen to people on the ground and like have one-to-one -one conversations in private and like get those that information and that then starts to inform the whole organization um and starts to instead of it being um and I think that's one of the key areas of kind of the gentrification of the organization that we need to really watch out for is that you you sometimes attend a big group meeting and you realize that 
um, every a lot of the people that are in the cafe in the daytime and are not the people represented in those meetings. So super important to work out like how we strategically do that. One of the ways that we've been doing that recently is by collecting and collating what we're calling user stories and kind of needs. And it's an ongoing process of needs gathering over a longer period where we can kind of cross examine and take different data points from different members of the community and groups it's not about undermining those people with wealth because obviously they're part of the community too you know so it's about actually creating a system and what we normally find is that there are shared needs because we're all human <laughs> you know the irony the irony of like oh right which people don't need what poor people want and poor people don't you know no they all want nice spaces they want nice places to go they all want, you know so it's like it's important that we create like that or continually reform that collective space um and we develop better and better models in which they can be produced because um, yeah, like it's, it's really important that as a community, we're all uh, aware of that and are all focused on maintaining the um, integrity of what we're trying to provide. Great, thanks, thanks for that, Lou. I don't know if you have anything, anything to add on that, Beth, at all, or if not, that's fine. Um, but what I'd also add that Louis done a, a talk going into a bit more detail as well, haven't you, about um, about the user stories and, and how you're actually sort of actively doing that as well. So yeah. you can maybe share a link to that as well. I yeah, bet. I'll, I'll send out that article actually. Uh, I, I wrote a quick yeah. medium. Also, I see this uh, mental is Camarado's wrote it. So Camarado's a brilliant um math pots and he was an early collaborator a lot of their living room projects are, are kind of connected to what we were doing at the very beginning of the project it's mm -hmm. super cool what they do and yeah he's a great speaker and like great writer as well super like maximum respect for math pots if you can follow him he's a he's a boss um so yeah sorry lou i think beth just wanted to interject with something so she's uh um so if you want to talk back please go sorry on. beth go on no it's all right yeah thanks just um it's just really interesting um there's been quite a lot of sort of community projects and what you were saying about the kind of the sort of more formal meeting where everyone sits around is not being suitable for everyone and I was interested in you talking about I can't remember what you call yourself a, a sort of signal what did you what was the name you said sort of sitting in the space and sort of observing and that a lot of the time when you ask people receiver. for feedback they say the things that they think feedback should sound like whereas when you're having conversations with people you get much more insight I think and mm -hmm. so all that's really interesting how you yeah and it's a shame sometimes because I think you know whether it's the more kind of official them sort of ask for things in a certain format um and a lot of it's intuitive maybe, you know, when you sort of talking to someone and you're picking up on their body language and, you know, little things that they say or being able to monitor, not monitor, but to, to record that is interesting mm -hmm. and important, I think. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it kind of, as an artist, kind of socially engaged artist, I'm kind of really aware that artists are quite often used as a, as a, means to bring in a certain kind of gentrification so that's kind of where the question kind of came from um mm -hmm. yeah yeah no, that's really um yeah i resonate with that it's a challenge i think we need to all do more work you know we need to all create proposals and systems that i think you know because we're only going to solve that collectively and from because for example like some of the systems you might propose in your organization there might be a bit of um, pushback on it but it might be the right system you know because the people who are giving pushback might be the people who are gentrifying it do you know <laughs> like so it's kind of there's this paradoxical problem where it's actually the uh, you're not trying to just kind of deconstruct the institution you're actually trying to create entirely new systems and new wiring of institutions that mean that people have their real voice heard and people who don't even know like at first they might not even know what they want or they might not even be asking for that they might you go oh my hips are really hurting it's like maybe you need you know it's like this idea of like <laughs> if the social sciences um is treated in the same way as the um the medical sciences then we might make some progress you know like maybe you need some like 
<laughs> social connectivity uh, or maybe you need some of this um, anyway not to go too deep down that oh, rabbit hole um, yeah I think we're gonna have to wrap up this just this part of the session um, just to go to a quick break before um, returning um, with um, James and social sculpture and um, Hannah and Russ from social pickle as well so um, I think we'll take five minutes so if, if everyone can sort of be back by can we say 12 past um, 12 past seven, that'd be great. Um, so cool. Yeah, we'll see you see you shortly. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Louis. Thank you, guys. Right.